Welcome to Life in Biology. I'm Dr. Joel Graf, and this is episode number nine. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Spanish flu and uh, what I consider to be a famous experiment where they resurrected the Spanish flu, uh, the 1918 flu in 2005 after all the virus had been extinct from the world. So a little bit about the 1918 flu. Each year we have a seasonal flu outbreak and it kills tens of thousands of people. But the the 1918 flu was the biggest pandemic we've ever had and when this happened 20 to 50 million people died it's hard to get an exact number um, because it was the early 1900s um, but all, anyway definitely biggest pandemic ever biggest number of people killed by the flu this happened during World War One so the world was a lot bigger prior to World War One but with World War One we start having troop movement everywhere and then that, then after that we have the world we have today where uh, people can travel uh, from country to country really quickly but this um, mixing of troops in World War One probably facilitated the spread of, of this virus uh, with this, with this influenza virus, the, the primary infection with your flu was pretty severe, but what killed a lot of people was secondary bacterial infections. So uh, you get the flu, it can cause some pathology to your lungs, and then it uh, uh, can give a foothold to bacterial infections later. And then uh, this flu is always people always mention the atypical demographics with this so if you look at the percent of people killed from a typical seasonal flu uh, and, and plot it against age most of the most of the deaths from seasonal flu are from ver the very elderly or the very young and so you have a u-shaped plot however with the 1918 flu you get a double u-shaped plot and this peak in the middle right in the middle represents the age group of uh, 15 to 34. So people in the prime of their health uh, were especially susceptible to this, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So how do you resurrect uh, an extinct virus? Well, first thing you need is this, you need to get sequences of, of the virus. So much of the tissue from that time has been degraded. However, they were able to find a couple sources where the tissue was good enough to get bits and fragments of, of the genome and then be able to stitch that together. Uh, examples of, of sources for this is that the military did autopsies on some military personnel that had died from the flu and uh, fixed um, the tissue and it's been archived and so they're able to go back into this archived material and get um, the genetic sequence from this virus. Um, and then also in Alaska in the permafrost where it's frozen constantly um, bodies in that uh, sort of uh, environment were able to uh, the tissue was able to be preserved well enough to get um, some some sequences from those samples now the first sequences came out in a publication in 1997 and I'll have uh, links in the show notes to to several of these um, to several of these studies and uh, eight years later the complete genome of, of the uh, of the virus was uh, came out and the influenza has a genome of eight segments eight RNA segments and uh, so all eight were complete by two, completed by 2005 now the 1918 flu was resurrected also in 2005 so this tells you that as soon as you know the sequence being able to get to the virus is a uh, pretty easy step. So how does that work? Well with influenza uh, they have established a reverse genetic system and so what you can do is you can take any flu you want um, to, to work with and if you sequence the eight um, genome segments and put each of those segments into a, a piece of DNA um, called a plasmid. These are small circular pieces of DNA that you can grow in a bacteria. The bacteria makes more copies of these plasmids and then you just take a big pile of bacteria, lyse them, and purify the plasmid DNA from the bacteria. And now you've got, you know, you have eight different lines of bacteria. Each one makes a different type of plasmid. You collect all those plasmids, you mix them together, and then you do a procedure called a transfection. So this is just mixing your DNA with a, a lipid-based reagent, and you can put that on your cells. That allows the DNA to get into the cell, and the cell knows what to do with that DNA. It starts making the RNA and protein, 
and once you build up enough protein, they assemble into virions and then the cell releases uh, influenza virions. So that's how this works and this can be done in a tissue culture disc. So this, this is a plastic plastic base with uh, cells just sticking onto that plastic. Uh, this is very common technique. In fact, I just did some transfections yesterday. So uh, there's obviously uh, calculations you have to do when you um, talk about bringing the deadliest virus that's ever been around back from extinction back into working with it and um, those sorts of um, risks and benefits uh, have been have been thought out and this is something that falls under the category of dual use what dual use means that the knowledge you gain from studying something could be used for good or it could be used for evil so you have those two two um, outcomes that could come from this same knowledge. Um, at this point, uh, there hasn't been any evil doing uh, with this virus. It's been contained at the CDC, and we've learned a lot. So a lot of good has come out of doing these studies. Now, the 19, well, one thing we've learned is that uh, other, other p flu pandemics since then, the 1957 flu, 68, and 2009 flu viruses, uh, they're all descendants of the 1918 influenza. Another thing that was interesting is that a lot of times if you're going to do uh, studies in mice with, with flu viruses, you have to pass them through mice a couple times and then they acquire a few mutations that allow them to replicate better in, in mice so that you get to the point of having um, virulent, virulent uh, uh, virus. And this 1918 flu virus it was virulent from the get-go. It was highly, it was lethal in the mice and caused severe damage. And the severe damage was due to something called cytokine storms. Um, the first time I ever heard the term cytokine storms was in, in regard to the 1918 flu virus. Basically, cytokines are proteins that cells use to communicate with each other. Cytokines often tell you if there's danger. And so cells start making these danger signals and it brings in uh, more immune cells and the immune cells uh, are, are all acting up and they can cause damage to your tissue. And that causes this severe pathology from the virus. And then we talked about secondary bacterial infections earlier. Those secondary bacterial infections can then um, take advantage of a damaged lung or airway and get, get hold and, and, and cause really severe pneumonia that could be lethal. One of the interesting things about the 1918 flu is that they they were able um, uh, oh the the 2009 flu was an H1N1 flu and I'll talk about uh, H1N1, H2N1 all those things later um, but the 1918 flu was also an H1N1 and so the 2009 was the first time we've had a pandemic from an H1N1 flu since 1918 and we were able to see that uh, if you if you vaccinate towards the 2009 strain you uh, it protected mice against the, the 1918 flu and then the long-term memory is really interesting when they got the virus in 2005 they were able to find people that had been alive during the 1918 flu and they took uh, blood samples from these people and found that uh, these people had antibodies still in their blood uh, being generated that would that um, would provide protection against the 1918 flu so over 90 years later uh, the, you, you still have immunology immunological memory and protection against the virus. So that's how you resurrect an extinct virus. Uh, hope you enjoy. Talk to you soon.